Today, I'm gonna to show you 10 wide lenses for astrophotography. Nowadays, there are so many lenses available for all different types of cameras, from the own brand lenses to third-party lenses and fully manual lenses. They all can get some great photos of the night skies as well, but some do a better job than others, and some make the experience pleasurable, whereas others just make it feel like hard work. And when you're out enjoying your hobby, the last thing you want to do is have it feel like a job. So I've done a load of research and found 10 different ultra wide lenses that work really well for astrophotography on full frame cameras. Now I shoot with Sony full frame cameras, so I will be basing this on that. But if you use a different brand, they'll probably be the equivalents for your brand. And also some of the third party lenses I look at will also have different mounts for different cameras. Now, as I've already said, there are so many more than this, but I've tried to narrow it down to my top 10. But if you have one that I haven't included that you think is worthy of buying, let me know in the comments below. Throughout this bit of research, I've looked at a lot of images from Flickr where I don't have access to those lenses just to see what the quality is like. The aim of this is to see if there are any problems or imperfections with the optics of the glass and not to take anything away from the photographers themselves. There are some great images to be seen online with all of these lenses, even though the glass might not be that perfect. So this just shows the perfect camera setup is not always needed. It's more to do with the person behind the camera. Now, if you like any of the images I've shown in this video, I've credited the photographers and put a link to each of their Flickr pages in the description below. So make sure to head over and follow them as they are all very talented photographers. The 16 to 35 f2.8 has been a standard lens to have for many pro photographers for years. And there are so many knocking around. Canon and Nikon have had a huge secondhand market and you can get some bargains. And with an adapter, you could easily use these on most mirrorless cameras. Sony have the G Master and even though it's pretty hefty, it is a great lens for astrophotography. With an aperture of f2.8, the 16 to 35 mm lets in enough light for astrophotography, and at 16 mm on a full frame, it is a nice wide angle to get a lot of the Milky Way in your photograph. Also, in the Sony G Master, there are so few imperfections in this lens. For a zoom, it does a fantastic job at controlling the coma and astigmatism in the corners at f2.8. Now, if the G Master is a bit out of your price range, there is the 17 to 28 mm from Tamron. It's slightly narrower, but at the fraction of the cost. It's a very good alternative as well. I own this lens and I've been out with it a few times. There is a little bit of coma and astigmatism at f2.8, but it does handle it well. So again, this is excellent for astrophotography. There is some rectilinear distortion towards the edges, but from all of the lenses I've looked at, the wide angle lenses always seem to have this. So it is something we have to live with at such wide angles. And to be honest, if you're that picky about how things look at 100% crop, wide field astrophotography probably isn't the best type of photography for you. Having the ability to zoom to either 28 mm with a Tamron or 35 mm with the Sony G Master gives you the option of a lot of different framings. However, if you stick to the NPF rule, your exposure times will be pretty short at 35 mm. I'm more of a 400 rule guy, so this range is really usable. Now, if you go secondhand or if you're a Canon or Nikon shooter, their lenses do have the focus window on the top of the lenses. So once you find the true infinity point, you can go back to that point time and time again because the lens has that marker on it. However, with the Sony 16 to 35 mm f2.8 and the Tamron 17 to 28 mm f2.8, they don't have any focus markings on the lens whatsoever. So you would have to rely on your manual focusing skills. It is pretty easy once you know how to do it. You've just got to be patient. And a few years ago, I did make a video on this. So if you're wondering how to focus on the stars with a modern lens that has no focusing markers on it whatsoever, check it out in the eye in the corner or the link in the description after this video. All in all, the Sony 16 to 35 f2.8 is a fantastic lens for astrophotography with very few imperfections. In fact, the only imperfection I'd say would be the price at $2,200. Now, if that is a little bit out of your price range, then the Tamron 17 to 28 millimeter is another good lens. And this comes in at $799. Recently, Sony released the 12 to 24 mm f2.8 G Master. This is an absolute beast of a lens, but it does come at a price. 
And if you thought the 16 to 35 F2.8 G Master was expensive, this goes to a whole nother level. It doesn't even give you enough change for a beer out of $3,000. With an aperture of f2.8 like the 16 to 35 mm this will let enough light in to get some great shots of the stars and with the focal range of 12 mm at its widest you'll be able to get some hugely wide shots of the night sky and you'll probably be able to get most of the sky in your shot now it is relatively heavy but not as heavy as i thought it would be it comes in at 847 grams now sony have done a great job in keeping this weight down for what this lens actually is. However, it is a big lens at nearly 14 centimeters long. So for a wide angle lens, it's gonna take up a lot of space in your bag. Now it is a solid lens and will give you some really good results. But at that cost, you could buy a second camera body, a handful of third party lenses, as well as a tripod. So a full setup with plenty of change for a beer. Now, when it comes to those imperfections, there aren't that many and it does take a really good shot. But like I said, for that price, it ought to be good. The Tokina Furin 20mm FE is a lens designed for the Sony FE system. There are two models, an autofocus and a manual focus lens. And manual focus systems are actually really good for astrophotography. The focusing rings will have markings on them to make it easy to get to that infinity point without even turning the camera on once you know where that infinity point is. With an aperture of f2, it lets in one more stop of light than the wide f2.8 zooms. So if you're in a dark location, this could be the difference between ISO 8000 and ISO 4000, or ISO 4000 and ISO 2000. So you can really stop that ISO down. Now, if you know about ISO invariance and how it works, this shouldn't matter. But the fact that there is a stop more of light coming into your camera will give the camera more light to work with in the first place. However, this lens does have some problems in the corners wide open. Coma and astigmatism is apparent and the corners are not that sharp. Even though it has that extra stop of light, you will have to stop it down to f2.8 to correct these problems. Now, if you're not familiar with manual focus lenses, you might be wondering why I keep talking about finding the infinity point. You might think, well, there's a marker on the lens, just turn it to that. However, not all lenses are the same and from copy to copy, this can change ever so slightly. So with one lens, the infinity point might be bang on that point that they've marked. And on another one, it might be a fraction to the left. And on another copy of the exact same lens, it might be a fraction to the right. So when you do buy a lens, it's really important to find that infinity point before going out. This will save you a lot of time and hassle if your lens is slightly out, so you know where it is and you know where to turn the focusing dial to get it spot on. Now I know 20 millimeters isn't ultra wide, but it is a wide angle and you can get some great shots of the night skies. But if you were thinking of a 20 millimeter lens for astrophotography and the Tokina caught your eye, I'd probably save up a little bit more money and get a Sony 20 millimeter F1.8 instead. This has a third of a stop more light gathering capabilities and is a little beast. It's super sharp and only has a small amount of astigmatism and chromatic aberrations towards those corners. At f1.8, it's better than the Furin at 2.8. Now, Alan Wallace did a fantastic review on this lens, so check it out after you've watched this video. I've put a link in the description to that review. And if you're into astrophotography and you don't know who Alan Wallace is, you should definitely follow him. He has a load of great videos on astrophotography and he's got a ton of knowledge in this photography field. So go and follow him, follow his YouTube channel and go and check out his website. Now, if you thought the 12 to 24 millimeter Sony was big, this is even bigger. It's over one kilogram at 1,170 grams. And the reason for this is the aperture of F1.8 at 14 millimeters. Nothing comes really close to being this wide and this fast. It does come at a price though, but not as much as the 12 to 24 millimeter from Sony. The Sigma 14 millimeter comes in just shy of $1,600. So you'd probably have enough out of 1,600 to buy at least a beer. Now this is another sharp lens and it's really sharp. However, it does suffer from coma and astigmatism in the corners, but at f1.8 and 14 millimeters, 
I think it's almost impossible not to have these issues. When stopped down to f2.8, these do mostly go. Another thing to note is that at this focal length, you will get stretch stars in the corners due to the wide focal length and due to that distortion of a wide lens such as this. And this is the same with most 14 mm lenses. The lens has to cram in so much that there is no getting around this distortion. And with astrophotography and the rotation of the Earth, this will be accentuated at those edges. Again, this has that little focusing window on the top, which most Sigma lenses do. And when you know where that infinity point is, you can turn it to that point time and time again. The Sigma 14 to 24 mm f2.8 is another super wide zoom. The image quality is better than the Canon EF 16 to 35 mm f2.8 L Mark III, and also the Nikon AF-S 14 to 24 mm f2.8 G. And the price is a lot better as well at around about $1,299. The weight is middle of the range at 795 grams, and the length of this lens is about 13 centimeters. The Sony E mount being a little bit longer than the Canon mount. Sigma have controlled the aberrations very well through the range and vignetting is minimal. The coma and astigmatism in the corners are less than expected as well. And this is less than the Sigma 14 mm f1.8, but there is over a stop less of light than that prime lens. So this is understandable. Now, if you want a versatile lens with a wide enough aperture to get some great shots of the night sky, as well as having a bit of a zoom range to play around with and to kind of get different crops and compositions, this is probably the one to go for, especially if you can't afford the Sony 12 to 24 millimeter f2.8. And let's be honest, who wants to spend $3,000 on one lens alone. This Sigma 14 to 24 mm f2.8 is almost half the price of the Sony, and all you lose is two millimeters on the wide end. Next, I'll look at a range of manual focus lenses. Like I've already said, these are fantastic for astrophotography as it's almost impossible to autofocus on the stars with so little light about at night. So manual focus lenses do actually help and they actually make the job a lot easier at night. There's a, a company called Venus Optics make the lower range of third-party lenses for the majority of cameras on the market. The 15 mm f2.8 is only a third of a stop slower, it's one millimeter narrower, and it's half the price of the Sigma 14 mm f1.8, as well as being much lighter. It's just over eight centimeters long and it weighs 500 grams. So this really is a small, neat package. Now this is a manual focus lens, so for everyday focusing, it is a lot slower than autofocus systems, but for astrophotography, it's really good. It's just a shame there aren't any electrical connections telling the camera what the aperture is. Also, it has a metal body and it feels very well built. Towards the corners at F2, there is some coma and a bit of distortion, even though it's called a zero distortion lens, but this is minimal and it's practically gone at f2.8. The coma and astigmatism also seems to be less than the Sigma 14 mm f1.8 in the corners and disappears sooner when stopping down. Now, if you want to read a great review on this lens, Daniel Ganga from Australia does this lens justice and he may have just about swayed my decision in which lens I'm gonna buy next. I've linked his review in the description below, so go and check it out after watching this video. Now the Samyang 14mm f2.8 is a lens that's quite dear to my heart as it was the first lens I bought specifically for astrophotography around about 10 years ago. Now unfortunately I dropped it and broke my lens and I haven't replaced it but that is one of the reasons I'm doing this research to find something to give me that super wide angle for astrophotography. The Samyang 14mm f2.8 which is also branded as Rokinon in some countries is a fantastic budget lens for astrophotography and if you're tight on cash, this would be the one to go for at $244. So that's less than a tenth of the cost of the Sony 12 to 24 millimeter G Master. It is 570 grams and the Sony version is just over 12 centimeters long. Although it just looks like the Canon version with an adapter permanently attached to it. And I think that's basically what they've done. Now it is another manual focus lens, which again is great for astrophotography once you know where that infinity point is. Now there are a few downsides to this lens. The vision I had was good and I got some really nice images from it, but I've read a lot of reviews stating that their versions were quite soft and they couldn't find that sharp point. So I think the tolerances in the factory are a little bit more slack than some other companies. So if you are buying it, 
I'd get one from Amazon or another place where you can return it if you're not happy with the copy that you get. If you do get lucky and find a good copy of it, they do give nice sharp results. Towards the edges, you do get some distortion and you do get some coma and astigmatism. But at the price point, it isn't as bad as you'd think. Now, the one I had was much better than a lot of the more expensive lenses on the market. I've taken some of my favorite images with this lens, so I could still be swayed by this. But with the options of wider apertures out there, I might just have to go for one of the faster primes. Now, there is an autofocus version of this lens, but I'd just stick with the manual focus lens if you're just using it for astrophotography. And because it's so wide, you'll find that that focusing point, you don't need to move it that much if you are doing big landscapes. Now, the IRIX 15mm is a lens made for the Canon EF mount. They also have a Nikon F mount and for some reason, a Pentax K mount. Now, for the Sony cameras, because it's a manual focus lens, you can get a dummy mount and this will work really well. It's a Swiss design, it's built in Korea and comes in a metal or a plastic model. The Blackstone is the magnesium alloy body and the Firefly is the plastic casting. Now, what this lens has is the ability to lock the focus ring. So you could, in theory, find that infinity point in the day, lock it off and then leave it there or find it at night and then lock it off once again. This does seem like a really good idea as when you're photographing the night skies, you tend to mostly focus on the stars at that infinity point and leave it there. Unless of course you're focus stacking or getting the stars out of focus and focusing on a foreground element instead. But for the most part, people want to get the stars perfectly in focus. This lens does come with a few problems though. Even though the image quality is good, the corner sharpness isn't great. There are minimal aberrations, but coma and stigmatism are pronounced. This is minimal when stopped down by one stop, but it is annoying. Looking at the images side by side, I'd say the Samyang does a better job in the corners than this. The Lauer 12mm f2.8 is another manual lens from Venus Optics. It's super wide lens and would work on both full frame and crop sensored cameras because it is so wide. It's relatively light as well at 615 grams. Although if you're a crop sensor shooter, you're probably used to a lot smaller lenses than this. It is a solid metal lens and that's probably what makes up a lot of this weight and it does feel really sturdy and really well made. I've used this lens a couple of times and it was okay, but it does take a little while to get used to that super wide angle. Now it does have a lot of vignetting as well as poor corner sharpness and some moderate levels of coma. So those stars at the edges will look a little bit like flies or seagulls instead of actual stars. Now, even though this is a solid lens, I wouldn't really recommend it if you're just buying it for astrophotography. With the vignetting and coma issues, I'd go with either the Lauer 15 mm or one of the slightly faster primes. After doing all of this research, it has helped me a lot in deciding what lens to get. And that's why I made this video because I wanted to pass that information on to you. The one that impressed me the most was the Sigma 14 to 24 mm f2.8. Even though it doesn't have the widest aperture and even though it doesn't have the widest focal range, it seemed like all of the others had to be stopped down to at least 2.8 to get a good shot whereas the Sigma was good at its widest aperture of f2.8. It is a big and heavy lens, so probably not good if you're hiking off to distant locations, but if you're driving to a location and you're parked nearby, then this lens would be a really good one to get. Now, the one that came in second place for me was the Lauer 15 millimeter. But again, it looks like you do have to stop this down to f2.8 to get a clean image. Now, if you're on a tight budget, the other one would be the Samyang. And if you get a good copy, this is an absolute bargain. I was really happy with the one that I had and I'm absolutely gutted that I dropped it. But now I'm looking forward to getting another ultra wide lens. So only time will tell as to which one I end up getting. I think I'm gonna wait to see what you guys have to say before making my mind up completely. A lot of you have given me some good advice in the past and I really appreciate that. And it's great that we can get together as a community. And like I said before, if there are any other lenses that I've missed, and I know I have missed a few, again, let me know in the comments below and let me know what you like the best. Also, do you own any of the lenses that I've mentioned? Do you love them or do you want to sell them to get something else? Again, let me know in the comments below. And let's make this a really good resource for ultra wide lenses for astrophotography. Now, if you like this video, click on this one next. Or if you're a binge watcher like me, click down here. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe for weekly tutorials in photography. 
I'll see you next time.